Good morning, Crossroads. He is risen. Oh, yes. 
I know that applies every day, but I've been waiting 360 some days to say that. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us. Happy Easter. Thank you for being here. Why don't we all stand and get into some worship? Amen, amen. God, we thank you that those words are true. God, we thank you so much for sending your son so we may have eternal life, God. Father, our Redeemer lives, and for that we are so thankful. We worship you. We praise you this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. amen. I don't like to wear a hat in the sanctuary, but I think this is special. What's that say? CIA, Christ is alive. Yeah. 
Welcome to Crossroads. Welcome, church. He's alive. I can't hear you. He's alive. Woo! We just like to welcome everybody, or everybody that comes. We're in the church family. This is what it's about. This is our day. They can't take this away. Our Savior lives. Our Savior lives. And we want the world to know our Savior lives. So welcome. Welcome to everybody. What do we got up there? Because I'm not doing announcements, huh? Oh, yeah, lock in last night. Is that the lock? Lock out. Lock out, lock in. <laughs> Little kitties was here last night. Look at that. They were having fun. I tried to get in. They wouldn't let me. That was the security guard when I walked up and said I wanted in. Danny, that was his face. <laughs> but we want to look at that fun they were having. It's about 18 kids, and we're just blessed to have Hannah and Danny and them doing such hard work with our youth. Welcome, kids. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> I was like, how can you not be awake after that first song? All right, we're going to get into our announcements this morning. First, today, we have a reception just after the service. We have a lovely spread that'll be out there in the foyer, so please come out there, enjoy some of the wonderful food, and fellowship with one another. Kids PJ Movie Night. This is coming up on, sorry, I'm trying to read that one, April 12th at 6.30. The kids are gonna be watching How to Train Your Dragon. And at the same time, we will have the ladies' movie night. They'll be watching The Shunning. So what's perfect about this is, ladies, you can come watch a movie, have dinner and fellowship, and send your kids down the hall. And they'll get to have fun and a movie and popcorn and pizza. So please be sure to join us for both of those. We want to welcome all of our new visitors who might be here today. If you're joining us for the first time, please be sure to see one of our greeters in the back, and they have a present for you. In addition, welcome all of our regular attenders, our members, anyone online. For those of you who are here, we have these communication cards, and they should be in the chairs in front of you or the pews in front of you. Please take a moment and fill them out. We want to be able to get in touch with you. We want to be able to pray for you. If you have any questions, Please write them down, and we'll be happy to get back to you, um, and especially prayer requests. And then ties and offerings. If you're new here, we don't pass a plate. Instead, we have boxes in the back where you can place your ties and offerings, as well as your communication cards. We want to thank you very much for giving to the church and to the very, very huge amount of ministries that we are blessed to have here because of our faithful supporters. So thank you very much. And now I'd like to invite Bobby and Priscilla up, and they're going to pray for us this morning. Good morning on this awesome day, and I have this really hoarse voice, so <clears throat> I'm hoping I can read these scriptures and you can understand me fine. Happy Easter. He is risen. Oh, sure. All right. I'm going to read a few scriptures, and then Bobby's going to pray for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And from Romans 10.9. If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And from Revelations, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe 
every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you are our Father. Thank you that you didn't just leave us here on our own, but you gave us your word to show us who you truly are and what you think about us. Thank you that even while we were yet sinners, you made a plan, you had a plan all along to die for us and pay the price for our sin, for my sin. You did that. You stayed on the cross because of me because of everyone here. Thank you so much, Lord. Thank you for your love. We cannot even fathom the depth of that kind of love that you wanna be with us. And I pray, Father, that you will open the hearts of everyone here and everyone listening. And for anyone who doesn't know you, Father, will you show them you want to be their savior and how very much you love them. Lord, we just ask that you'd be with us today. We thank you for Ron, Pastor Ron. Lord, we pray that you would bless his mouth, that as his words come out into our ears, that you would do an amazing thing, Lord, that it would be you speaking, your Holy Spirit would be speaking to us, and that we would listen. We want to follow you, Lord, and we can only do that in your strength and with your power. So we ask you to overflow us with your power, Lord, Will you call us into times of refreshing with you, time spent in your word, that we might radiate that love out to the world. Father, we want to show the world that you love them. We thank you for saving us from the darkness into the light. Lord, we ask for our church that we would continue to be a light on the hill, that your word would continue to go forth that you would show us the ministries you want to do, that you would bring many people to be involved in ministry, that you would um, prick the hearts of each person here and show them what place you have them in the church. And Lord, we ask for new families, we ask for young children, we ask for young people to come and to learn more about you, Father. We want to be blessing this community for you. And we ask that you would do that, Lord. And now we just give you our world, our church, our families. Father, please come and breathe new life into us. May we be holy as you are holy. Thank you, Father, in the powerful resurrection power of Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Okay, now we're gonna take a moment, everybody if you can stand up, and we're gonna walk around, we're gonna greet somebody, try and find somebody who you don't normally say hi to, or somebody who might be new.
All right, folks, make our way back to our seats. Although we can stand back up because we are going to keep worshiping here this morning. All right, kiddos, students, if you are nursery, nur excuse me, nursery through 12th grade, you are now dismissed to your classes. Parents need to go with them this morning to sign them in and get your pager, please. And if you do not know where you are headed, follow the crowd. But kids, you are dismissed.
can't beat those old hymns, am I right? Amen?
That's going to be such a good day, Father. Such a good day when we can just start eternity with nothing to concern us, with only you. I thank you, God, that you've helped us reduce the enormity of you to our feeble understanding. We struggle to comprehend so much. I thank you that you've made it simple for us. Christ, through Christ crucified, is all we have to know. Remind us of that. Keep that in us. And expand our understanding from there until we get to have full knowledge of you in eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everyone. I would like to uh, ask of you a favor this morning. It's not often I would ask this type of thing. I'd like you to each make a commitment this week to spend some time studying the passage that the message will be from. The passage this morning, all passages in the Bible are worth studying a lot, okay? This one is worth studying a lot more than a lot. <laughs> the richness in the passage before this morning is much bigger than any of us. It is rich, 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 and there's so much more there that I, I know that I realize. I am humbled by the passage this morning, and I'd like you to commit to spend some more time in it during the week, and you'll see why as the message goes along. By the way, I appreciate the enthusiasm this morning from the, uh, the musicians up on the stage here. Now, I don't know, I tend to notice things I shouldn't notice, Ask my family, and I'll say amen to that. I noticed something maybe I shouldn't have noticed, but I noticed it. I noticed a subtle rebuke this morning at the vain, the vain uh, superstitions of the, in the world today. Do you realize there were 13 musicians up here? <laughs> Can you, can you think of a, a better way to give the devil a slap? <laughs> we don't care about your dumb superstitions. We believe in the risen Lord. We're going to live and we're going to sing. And we're going we're gonna to champion the cause of the risen Lord. And we're going to do it with 13 of you, okay? <laughs> and then many more joining in. So this morning... We're dealing with uh, Ephesians, the last part of chapter 1, the first half of chapter 2. I'd like to give you a little bit of background here about the book of Ephesians. The Apostle Paul wrote this letter, six chapters. I won't fall off the chair, don't worry. <laughs> he wrote this letter to the church in Ephesus while he was a prisoner in Rome. Evidently, he was in what might be called a house arrest. It sounds like that when you read the last part of the book of Acts, which is where uh, he was when he wrote this letter. Now, the Apostle Paul, of course, started out in his young years as somebody who was radically against 
the cause of Christ. He was radically against any that would take a stand for Jesus the Christ as the risen Lord. He went so far as to even be involved in the conviction of people to be stoned to death because they were believers in Jesus the Christ. And the Lord appeared to him on one of his missionary journeys, missionary for the devil, and when he was trying to go to Damascus to arrest under the high priest's orders to arrest Christians, bring him back and have them dealt with. And of course, the Lord appeared to him, Jesus Christ, the Lord appeared to him, and his life was turned around. Praise God, he changed his emphasis in life. He changed his emphasis in life to where he was then foremost in winning people to stand up for Jesus the Christ, our risen Lord. And uh, as he served, he became what we would call a missionary. <laughs> Wasn't so much a New Testament term there, but uh, it has some meaning there. It's worthwhile. And he went from Syria, Antioch of Syria, up into what we'd call Turkey, went across Turkey, crossed over from Asia to Europe. We ought to be thankful he made that trip into Europe because um, we might have a few ties to Europe ourselves. And he went into Macedonia. Then he went down into Greece. And finally, after he went back to Jerusalem, where he was arrested by the Romans, really, they arrested him to protect him from the Jews who wanted to kill him. And then he had to appeal to Caesar because of a plot against his life. So he ended up on a ship headed for, as a prisoner, headed for Rome. He kind of took over the ship when they were in danger of being shipwrecked. And here the prisoner, Paul, ended up admonishing the people on the ship about how to act and that they would be safe if they would just follow some instructions. Then he ended up in Rome under house arrest. And there in Rome, as a prisoner, he wrote the book of Philippians. He wrote the book of Ephesians. He also wrote Colossians and also Philemon. What a ministry. I don't know. If I was in his place, I might have been feeling sorry for myself. Say, God, I've done a lot. Is this what I get for, for serving you? But Paul knew why he believed in Jesus. He knew what was worthwhile, and he knew what wasn't worthwhile, and he served the risen Lord till the death because Jesus was risen again. And that, that's why we meet every Sunday, by the way. Every Sunday is Easter, okay? <laughs> Nothing against the special Easter, but uh, we love our risen Lord and admire him worship him, and live for him. So at this time, I would like us to stand, if you would. I'd like us to stand and read maybe a little longer section of verses than usual. But you know, on Easter, it's not a take it easy time. <laughs> on Easter, it's a time to express your faith in our risen Lord. So let's read Ephesians 1, verses 18 through 24, and then we'll read the first, I think it's 10 verses of chapter 2. Let's, uh, let's read. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe that power is the same as the mighty strength. Now, just stop a bit. Before we move on, I want you to notice here that Paul prays, and he's telling the Ephesus Christians, he prays for them for certain things. And in this case, he prays that they'll be enlightened to understand the hope that they have in Jesus Christ, and they'll know the power, and we're going to say more about that. So the last phrase there, that power is the same as the mighty strength. Let's go ahead. <clears throat> The mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead 
and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in this present age, but also in the one to come. Now, I want you to remember those words. I'm not going to reread them, but we refer to these words later in the message. The power that was exerted by God in raising Christ from the dead. And in a position of, he was raised to be at the right hand of the Father so that he would have all authority over every other power, regardless of where it is. Let's continue. God placed all things under his feet, appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Let's continue. Now, uh, this part, we need to read slowly. This is the part that you're going to have to dig. We will not be able to dig out everything in it this morning, but there is a lot here. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. I want us to read that verse one again. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Continue. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following his desires and thoughts. Hold on. It must be talking about some terrible people. Couldn't be talking about me. <laughs> like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions, it's by grace you've been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. In order that the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it's by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by work so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepares in advance for us to do. Now, before we take that down, I want you to just cast your eyes over verses 8 to 10 there. And is that talking just about what we do now in this life? Or is there some indication of what might be going on in eternity? Just a question. You may sit down. If you want, you can stay standing up. I don't care. <clears throat> so in review already, because we've read it, the Apostle Paul loved the people at Ephesus. He had spent evidently about three and a half years in ministry to the church there, had great success, but also had great opposition. But many people became Christians. They had problems, it's the same as we do. He wrote to them to upgird their faith. He wrote to them that they might understand the blessings that they have in Christ Jesus. In fact, the first half of, the, of chapter 1, just the verses just before we, what we read, he, he said to them, you have been given all of the blessings in the heavenly realms. You've been given all the blessings from Almighty God. And he says, it's because of your love. And the thanksgiving I have for you because of your love that I pray for you. And as he pointed out in the verses we read, he said to them, 
I pray that you'll be enlightened, that you'll understand, that you'll know the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. Hope's a big thing. And he says, I pray that you'll have knowledge, that you'll have knowledge of the power of God. And this is where it starts to get so, so rich. Because in the verses in chapter 1, he tells how the power of God worked in Christ Jesus. Then in chapter 2, he tells how that same power worked in similar ways in our lives. And because of that, then we can have a knowledge of the power of God that leads us into a life of service, of hope, of works that come from him through us and help others enjoy the same blessings that we do. I know there's so much more in that passage than we're going to see this morning. That's why I challenge you, maybe take a few days this week and study these verses more and see what more that they say, well, why didn't Ron Edson get this? Well, the reason Ron Edson didn't get it is because he couldn't get it all. But uh, that's okay. Now, so there's a kind of a general flow to the message this, this morning then. We are going to see that we are a lot like Jesus. You say, wait a minute, that sounds almost blasphemous to me. We are blessed in ways that are like Jesus blessed us. And we're going to see some similarities there that I believe will boggle your mind. So help me, if you walk out this morning and your mind hasn't been boggled, then I've failed. Okay? And so the first point this morning is, uh, is a way that may not be uh, too encouraging. But don't, don't falter at this one, because if it were not for the truth of this one, you wouldn't be realizing the blessings of the next ones. Like Jesus, believers were dead. Oh, thanks a lot, buddy. First off, Jesus. Now, you say, well, that's kind of, that's kind of spending time on something that's pretty obvious, isn't it? Jesus died. Well, one of the stupidest things, and you need to be careful how you use that word stupid. Jesus had some warnings about calling people stupid. But uh, I believe one of the most inane things that can be said to counteract the belief in the resurrection is that Jesus never died. Have you ever, have you heard of anybody saying Jesus didn't die? A lot of money has been made about writing books on that subject. Jesus didn't die. Imagine telling a Roman soldier who was trained in how to crucify people that he, they didn't succeed in killing Jesus. Sounds kind, of, kind of crazy, doesn't it? Why, when there was a request that the body of Jesus could be taken, what did Pilate do? He took the steps to assure that Jesus had died. And part of the reason for that was because Jesus had died sooner than expected. That's not too surprising when you take a look at what Jesus had been putting up with the last couple of days. So it's not surprising that he died. What is surprising is that intelligent people in our century can have the audacity to say, well, we don't believe in the resurrection because Jesus didn't die. And uh, that's why I say that's, that's close to getting stupid. If I offend you, I'm sorry. <laughs> Jesus died. Now, it's just as inane for any of us as humans to say we haven't died, and I'm not talking physically now, that we haven't died because of sin. That is a powerful statement in the first four verses of chapter 2. We're like Jesus. Jesus died on the cross. We died in our sins. Our death and our sins put us in a position of great need because the death that we've experienced in sin separates us from each other. People are, well, our world is full of separation. Countries can't get along with countries. One side of the border can't get side, uh, along with the people on the other side of the border. 
people of one side of the aisle in Washington, D.C. or Salem or wherever can't get along with people on the other side of the aisle. There's separation everywhere in our society. It's because we're dead in sin. Sin brings death. And it's, we're, we're all going to physically die. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about what we experience in this life. We all know that. We're in dire need. Our potential as human beings is crucified, may I say, is put to death. Our potential is killed because of sin in our life. We are in great, great need. And the biggest part of the death thing is that we're separated from our God who created us. Our sin puts us in a position of needing a miracle. And Jesus' death for us is that miracle. And so one thing we all need to acknowledge this morning, I need Jesus. I need him. And that takes some humility to admit because we like to be in a position of having no dependence on anybody. I like to make my own way, thank you. I didn't stay and live with my parents till I was 32. I moved out when I was 31. <laughs> no. Get my point? We like to be independent, and we don't want to be dependent upon anyone. But our own sin puts us to death in a separation between us and God and ultimately results in a separation from just about everything around us. So we all stand before God with a basic need, and that basic need is one of forgiveness, it's one of grace, it's one of mercy, it's a one of purpose. All of these we need, and we can only get that from our wonderful, great God. So we're in need, we're dead, we need to be risen. Thank God for the next, the next way that we're like Jesus. Like Jesus, we've been, as believers, we've been resurrected. Now, we were here this morning on Easter Day, and we're rejoicing in the abundance of energy on that subject. We're, we rejoice and be able to have it ring out, he is risen, and he is risen indeed. And they go back and forth. And it could be even uh, played on a little more as uh, we'd have uh, almost competition between sides of the auditorium. Who can echo that great phrase most? Well, it is a blessing. But think of it from the perspective, first off, of Jesus, like Jesus, resurrected. It's amazing to me that as you read the writings of the day, when immediately after Jesus, the, the objection to Christianity was not that Jesus didn't arise. It's interesting to me, I don't believe there's much written trying to prove that Jesus didn't arise. It was too well known that he did arise. Even the Jewish historian Josephus acknowledges the resurrection of Jesus. And so the question was not, did Jesus arise? The question was, is it a threat to the system we have in our day and that we, during their time? Jesus arose from the dead. But now, like Jesus, we have been resurrected through our faith in Jesus Christ. That means our potential, one of the, one of the things I point out about us human beings, sin compromises our potential as human beings. Our potential is greatly expanded because of our belief in Jesus Christ. So wait a minute, Ron, are you teaching the, uh, the health and wealth gospel? No, what we need is not wealth. What we need is a wealth in Jesus Christ. What we need is a peace that can allow us to have blessings without worrying about losing them. Because the richer we get, the richer we get, the more we got to lose. The more we got to lose, the more we got to worry about. The more we got to worry about, the more we need more sleeping pills. The more we need more sleeping pills is the more we need other kinds of pills that counteract the bad effects of the sleeping pills. And so it goes. 
We are in great need because of the sin that we have, and we need to have a true resurrection. And we have a new resurrection because of a uniting with Jesus Christ. We have the opportunity for a uniting of with each other. We have an opportunity for a uniting of the purposes for which we live. And so the blessing of the resurrection we have as believers in Jesus Christ is tremendous and is a blessing that the highest science cannot counteract. So we live in a blessed world that is resurrected because of Jesus Christ. Say, wait a minute, what do you mean a resurrected world? Jesus is in a process. He's a process of saving us and the process of bringing, if you read in the first part of Ephesians 1, he's in a process, process of reconciling the world. You read that in the blessings that we've received from Jesus Christ as outlined in the first half of Ephesians 1. So like Jesus, believers have been resurrected. Let's move along to the next way that we're like Jesus. Now, I said that it's a bigger subject than me. And this is where the power of God becomes even more tremendous. And my own ignorance, and I don't think it's just mine, but our own ignorance sometimes becomes more obvious. There is more here than you're going to hear this morning. But take it, get a taste, and then study it more later. Like Jesus, they, that would be the believers in Jesus Christ, have been seated in the heavenly realms. Now, a little bit about the term heavenly realms. Different translations translate that different. Not a big problem there, but just shows the inadequacy sometimes of language to express the richness that's from our God. I believe the New American Standard calls it the heavenly places. This is a New International Version, calls it the heavenly realms. Other, more literal translations even, will just say the heavenlies. Why is that? Well, in the Greek, there is not, there's not a separate word for realms. In fact, if you look at translations that have heavenly realms, it'll probably have realms written in a italics, which means there's not a Greek word there for it. It literally is saying that uh, they have been seated in the heavenly, in the heavenlies. Now, <laughs> I, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands here, but would I would be curious to know. What are the heavenly realms? What are the heavenlies? What are the heavenly places? Just a little review here. Uh, in Ephesians 1, verse 3, it says that we have been blessed with every blessing in the heavenlies or in the heavenly realms, heavenly places. Christians have received every blessing from the heavenlies. Where is that? What is that? Then in the passage that uh, we read this morning, Ephesians 1 and verse 20, is it? Jesus, after his resurrection, ascended to be with the Father in the heavenlies, in the heavenly places at the right hand of the Father. Then we read later in Ephesians 2 that we have been Raised, we yes, resurrected, but we have been ascended to be with Jesus. Present tense, not future. We are now in the heavenly places. Then in chapter 3 and verse 10, it makes a, 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 a statement that ought to encourage us as a church. It says in Ephesians 3.10 that through the church the wisdom of God would be known in the heavenly places. Well, if that doesn't give us a reason to keep going as a church, if that doesn't give a reason to stand for what is right, if that doesn't give a reason 
to get the word out to others so they can be a part of it too. I don't know how big a reason you can get. Somehow in the heavenly realms, God's wisdom will be made known through his church. And then chapter 6, it says, I think it's in verse 12, it says that our battle is against the forces in the heavenly realms. Now, I, I don't know how you would diagram, I don't know how you would draw the map that would show the heavenly realms. You might try it. I would suggest that you not take out your smartphone right now and go to the GPS abilities of it and try to locate it. I have a sneaking hunch that the heavenly realms, the realms of God, is the whole shooting match. Say, wait, what do you mean? How much of the universe did God create? Yeah, 99.99999. No, it's just 100%. It's all his. Where does our battle take place? Well, it takes place here. But it takes place evidently against forces, not here, but forces that are here. Do you catch the, the uh, inexactness of my statement? Where are the forces that we counteract? Ephesians 12 make it obvious we're fighting some forces that you don't lay your hands on in a physical way. And yet they have power here. We are physically here, I think. I, I think I could actually see people here physically. But Ephesians 2 says we have been translated to be with Jesus, who is at the right hand of the Father in the heavenly realms. And where is that? Well, it's not Texas. And nothing is Texas. You don't locate it on a map. So we are somehow, I hate to use the word metaphorically because I think it's real, but we are with Jesus in the heavenly realms. And I finally decided the heavenly realms is a whole shooting match. We are with God in his universe, operating as his agents to bring him glory. That's why we're here. And we have an opportunity to be involved with God to great potential because of who he is. It's a giant blessing and one I don't understand completely, but I know it's there and I know it's awfully big. Now, let's just talk for a bit about the impact in our current life, let alone the eternity to come. If we are with God, we're with Jesus at the right hand of God in the heavenly realms, that means if you are faced with some obstacles in life, that seem bigger than you can handle, you're not alone. Is there anyone here that has any obstacles in life that are kind of, kind of big? Anybody have any obstacles in life that are kind of big? You ever feel kind of hopeless? Sometimes we kind of feel hopeless. We're serving a God with Christ at his right hand. So that means we are with God. We're with our Savior, and he is with us. Is there anyone here, you don't need to show your hands on this one. Is there anybody here that's done any big sins? <laughs> well, you haven't done any little ones. <laughs> anybody ever felt like your sin was bad enough that you wondered whether it could be forgiven or not? You don't need to raise your hand. Is there anybody ever wondered, oh, I can't imagine Jesus continuing to love me 
because I know what goes on between my ears and sometimes it's not as good as it ought to be. We are at the right hand of the Father because of our faith in Jesus Christ. With Jesus, who means, means he is with us, he is helping us, he is encouraging us, he's providing hope for us, even though we are us. I think you get what I mean by that. We are us. I am who I am. And sometimes I am what I ain't. Oh, yeah, be. Yet, because of faith in Jesus Christ, he is with me and causing me to change to become more like Jesus Christ. That provides a giant amount of hope for our stance for Jesus, for our love in Jesus, and for hope beyond in Jesus. And so if you're facing some stuff, and I suspect you are, if you're facing some stuff, remember you're with Jesus at the right hand of the Father. Like Jesus, they've been seated in the heavenly realms. Now, there's another way we're like Jesus, and this one is a little bit different. Like Jesus, they will be receiving these benefits for the ages to come. If you look at verses around verse 20, I can't remember the exact verse, 19, 20, 21 in chapter 1, it's talking about the authority that Jesus has because he was raised back to be with the Father. And it mentions he's over every authority even mentions specifically the authority in the church. He's over all. And he says, this is for the ages to come. Now, that means Jesus' authority goes beyond what's the date that Jesus is coming back again? We don't know. But Jesus' authority is eternal. Now, the interesting thing about that is in chapter 2, it says that his grace is going to be evident in the ages to come to and through us. That means we're like Jesus in the ages to come in that we will be evidences for almighty God forever, for ages to come. That means you do count for something. Not because of who you earned, but because of what God has made you. That means we count for something because of Jesus' work in us. And that means this life is worth the living. That means that when I'm facing obstacles, I don't know how they're going to work out. Life is still worth living. Life is worth living regardless of what the devil throws at you because you serve the almighty God who is greater than all. The amount of power in this universe is amazing and it's a drop in the bucket compared to God's power. His love and grace are greater than all of our love and grace because he is the one that empowers us strengthens us and gives us not only a reason to live, the ability to do it. Easter's a big deal. And I don't just mean this Easter. I mean the 365 days of Easter. Jesus is always the risen Lord. Amen. I'm not knocking, uh, keeping Easter and remembering especially, but let's remember Easter 365 days a year, or is it 25 7 or 24 7? <laughs> All right? Like Jesus, believers be receiving the benefits for the ages to come. Now I said, Boy, that's an awful lot you're saying, Ron. And I said, Yeah, it is. It's more than I understand. It goes beyond my mental capabilities, but I know we serve a God that's bigger than my definition of God. 
I know I serve a God who has a whole lot more power than I can even imagine, let alone power I have. I serve a God that's so intelligent that there is, what's the program? That where they earn all the money because they know a lot? Yeah, Jeopardy. <laughs> well, I tell you what, God is in no danger of being jeopardized by Jeopardy. All right? He is the one and the only one. So uh, let's look at the next, uh, next thing here. I think we'll be able to in on this. This, all that we've talked about, is a demonstration of God's first power. Now, if you're taking notes, you might find power in an empty spot in your piece of paper. Circle it and put three arrows down. One like that, one like that, one like that. Under this one, write love. In the middle one, write mercy. And the other one, write grace. His power extending to us love, mercy, and grace. Now, just for a minute, let's think. God's power in providing all this for us is so great that it overcame the obstacles of Satan himself to overcome the resurrection story. Satan has tried throughout history and continues to try to overcome the power of our God. God is so great that uh, we know who the winner is going to be. Now, from that power, or maybe you can say the power comes from the love, but we have love. Why would God, why would God ever want to serve, or serve, save a wretch like me? Why would God want to save a person that has allowed in his head some thoughts that are anything but righteous? For those of you who have never had any bad thoughts, I praise you. How could God have mercy for my sin? If you thought about what the world of sin is, the amount of loss of everything due to sin, how much of the United States government's national debt is due to sin? I heard somebody say all of it. The mercy of God is beyond comprehension. Yet it's mentioned in the very verses we're studying this morning. Now, mercy is when you don't get what you deserve. Grace is when you get what you do. Mercy is when you don't get what you deserve. Grace is when you get what you don't deserve. You know, it'd be a big, it would be a big blessing just to not receive what I do deserve. But that doesn't define God. He's a God on both sides of this line. He's a God on the side of the line that not only doesn't give you what you ought to get, he gives you what you ain't ought to get. And so the grace of God just builds on the mercy is not only am I going to punish you, I'm going to give you blessings for the ages to come. And that's from a God of power, a God of love, a God of mercy, and a God of grace. Now I ask you, what is the one rational decision that would come from that? The one rational decision is to admit point number one. 
without Christ, I'm as dead as a doornail. And a doornail has no life. I am dead without Jesus Christ. I come to the point where I say, yes, the evidence is very strong. Jesus arose from the dead. That is a, that is a necessity in our faith, but it's as true as true can get. He arose from the dead. He placed, he was placed himself at the right hand of the Father over all authority, and he has the love to include me. He has the love to include you, to be with him in the universe project of the ages. There is no project in our universe that's bigger than this one. All because of his power and his love that gives us grace and mercy. Only one wrong, right decision. And then to say to the Father, God, I've sinned. I thank you for Jesus. I want to live with Jesus. I want to live for Jesus. I want my life to be wrapped up in him. There is nothing more important than making a decision for Jesus the Christ. And this morning, if you've not come to Jesus, I challenge you. It's the biggest decision you'll ever face. And there's just one logical decision and it is say yes to Jesus, the loving, the powerful, the graceful, and the merciful God of our Father, God, God the Father of our Jesus, our Savior. This morning, we come together for the Lord's Supper. This is not just a little add-on thing. We come together for the Lord's Supper because we want to remember with Jesus what he's done for us. We want to remember with Jesus the eternity that he's giving us. We want to remember with Jesus that our past, he no longer remembers the bad past. He has forgiven us. He's wiped it out. And we are living in Redemptionville. We are living with him eternally. And so let's partake together of the emblems of the Lord's Supper in appreciation, in commitment, in a decision that to God, I don't care what comes, I'm standing with you because I know that Jesus Christ is with me at your right hand. Father in heaven, thank you for Jesus the Christ. Thank you, God, for Jesus the Son. Thank you for Jesus the Savior. Thank you for Jesus the King. Thank you, Father. For you, God, that you so loved the world, you gave your only begotten son, that those who believe in you might be eternally saved. Oh, God, you are so great, so loving, so merciful, so graceful. We thank you, and we will praise your name eternally. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Thank you so much 
We thank you that that debt has been paid in full for sending your son for our sins, Father. Help us to remember, God, that that is an everyday thing, not just on Easter Sunday. God, help us to remember that your son came, died on that cross so we may be saved. And our sins are not too big to be forgiven, God. For that, we thank you. We love you. We praise you for your power, your mercy, your love, and your faithfulness, God. We are so undeserving, but we thank you so much. As we leave this place, help us to exude that love and help us to remember the sacrifice you gave. In your name we pray. Amen. Like always, guys, at the end of service here, we're going to have our prayer team up front. If you guys have any prayer requests, anything you want to talk about, please join us in the lobby. Don't go anywhere. We've got refreshments, snacks, all of the above. And there's going to be an Easter egg hunt, I believe, happening downstairs as well. So thanks for joining us. Happy Easter. We'll see you next Sunday.